It's for women.ie. Great value car insurance for those on the go. Get the cover you need day or night at it's for women.ie. It's time to own it. Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Now then, welcome back. So Rory O'Connor from the Irish Independent is here in studio. And then there were 40. Yeah. In this X Factor esque culling process that is the World Cup, we have moved to the judges' houses uh, stage, I would say. Live shows me. are around the corner. It is me. Don't I'm lie. Everyone, really? everyone, no. everyone knows the X Factor uh, route. Come on. <laughs> Boot camp, judges' houses, the live show. It would make quite a, uh, quite a TV show if you actually did. You know, if IRFU TV were doing that, I think that would do good numbers for the oh, IRFU yeah. if they were having, you know, Joe was making those phone calls and he couldn't see who was on the other line until they picked up. And yeah. Giving them hard, you know, oh, no, face hard to decisions. face, face to face. Yeah, he said he might not have time. Come in and give a reason. Um, so today, the three players who had the conversation they didn't want to have were John Cooney, Finley Beelham, and Mike Haley. Yes. The big talking point clearly is Cooney and what it tells us about the uh, format and shape of the squad. Yeah. It was a surprise, I think, to most people. I think uh, John Cooney has been one of those people that you assumed his versatility would be a huge bonus to him and would probably get him on the plane mm -hmm. because he has the ability to cover both scrum half and fly half and um, everyone's doing the maths on whether he'll bring three and two on either side or whether he'll bring three of each. Um, and I think this what this points us towards is the fact that Joey Carberry will end up being that person who covers both, even though he doesn't have the senior experience that John Cooney does mm. and that Joe Schmidt is willing to take the same risk he took in 2015 by bringing three out halves and two scrum halves. And Cooney, despite all of the excellent work that he's done for Ulster since he went up there, um, becoming a leader, a clutch goal kicker, uh, really controlling number nine, and probably, maybe Luke McGrath would argue this point, but the closest thing there is to Conor Murray out there, uh, apart from Conor Murray, um, it's just not where Joe Schmidt, he's not where Joe Schmidt wants him to be, and never really has been. I had a quick look through the figures, and of the four scrum halves, he's played the least uh, over this World Cup cycle, you know, even though McGrath has had injuries, he's he's got eleven, I think, and uh, Cooney has eight appearances. Marmion's well ahead, and I think that indicates probably that Marmion is the one who who will go. And, and actually, Schmidt has been pretty consistent throughout, and has the signs of being there all along. Mm. But to have him go this early was a surprise, and gives a nice indication because we're not getting a lot of access to Joe Schmidt right now as is his want um, to ask him questions about this sort of stuff and when he does get the questions he generally doesn't give a straight answer which is his prerogative that this is a nice window into his, his thinking as to where he's going and the Bielan one I think Haley was always going to go in this round yeah. um, He, I think he was in bonus territory to get his cap last Saturday and, and you know if he's there in case of emergency if, if a fullback if Rob Kearney goes he could well end up in Japan because we're so uh, light in that department mm. but Bielham's absence effectively confirms that Andrew Porter and John Ryan will go to Japan mm. So on the um, Cooney thing for a second if there'd been any thinking that they might have been going three scrum halves Sexton Carberry and Cooney to cover yeah it's now flipped on its head so it's going to be Sexton Carberry to cover as scrum half and a third out half going yes so this is Jack Cardi uh, by a distance in pole position. I would. I, I mean, Rossburn not being involved in the Six Nations would indicate that Rossburn is playing catch up. Jack Carty was the one player who got a modicum of criticism from Joe Schmidt in his aftermatch comments on Saturday. Uh, just said that he took a bit of did time to get up to speed uh, off the bench against Italy. I thought he did quite well in a fairly fractured, scrappy period of the game, but definitely the quality dropped after Carberry went off. But then we don't know how much time he's had on the pitch. I mean, Carberry, they're obviously investing in Carberry quite heavily because they expect him to play a bigger role. So, Carty, yeah, I, I can't see Rossburn going ahead of Carty at this point. He, he just, why would you have left him out of the Six Nations if you had him in your World Cup plans? He's, I think he's one of a couple of players that are still in there just in case. Mm. So that if they get called up late, they know every element of the playbook that they've been exposed to the to the, uh, the, the, the whole setup from a long time out and I think this is going to be quite an important week in Portugal um, and again houses. Judges Houses is a huge <laughs> week exactly exactly through this with you <laughs> uh, so Joey Carberry the prognosis is maximum of six weeks four to six is what they're saying and it's very rare for the IRFU to come out with an actual pro time li yeah. line on it now that would go with Joey's 
blessing he has to sign off on all of the injury stuff. It's quite helpful. It is what it, I've been hearing for a couple of days. Four is the number that I've been, I've been hearing, yeah. um, which that, is good news. Does that pretty much re- that rules him out of the warm-up game? He won't though. play again in the warm-ups. Yeah. Uh, he won't play again until September 22nd against it, Scotland. Okay. But he was good for that 55 minutes, and he hadn't played for months, so I, I'm really not that concerned about that. I think the concern would be that he wouldn't be on the bench at all for that Scotland game, because we saw... When Sexton went down against Scotland in the Six Nations, he's well able to beat Scotland. He's well able to cope in that 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 company. Yeah. And he gives while Carty, I think, played really well in the Six Nations and could do a job off the bench quite quite well. Mm. Carberry just has that. I, sorry, I, I hesitate the word X factor because uh, partly because we've been talking about it, and also because it's just so cliched. Yeah. But he does have that ability to come up and just ask different questions of a defence. And if Ireland are in a tight game, he has the capacity to come on and break it wide open, even as a fullback or a, you know he's more versatile than Carty. So I think they would like sorry, they would definitely they, they they would feel they need to have him there for that game, yeah. um, and he will play a big role. I think he, he'll probably start the two games after. So it'll be Johnny Sexton against um, Scotland. Scotland and Japan, and then Samoa and Russia will be I presume Joey Carberry starting, and that gives him a nice that'll give him enough time that he's ready for a quarter final anyway. Mm. So that's it's good news. I mean, it could have when he was coming off with his head in his hands on that stretcher, that did not look good. No, it's true. You were at the um, press conference, I presume, on at the Aviva after the Italian game. Mm. Joe Schmidt was there. He was asked how Carberry's absence might change his use of Johnny Sexton in the build up to the Scotland game, and he was saying, "Look, we'll have to think about it. We'll have to see." I mean, it doesn't make Johnny Sexton any necessarily more important because he's just so important anyway. So you would love to wrap him in cotton wool and have him pitch up on the 22nd, but then he's not going to be his best. So unfortunately, you just have to play him in some of these warm-up games and cross your fingers. That's yeah, the reality. and I think what he's do, going to do, I stand to be correct on this, is use the next two games, which is after his, his nice uh, warm weather training camp in, in Portugal, yeah. as basically a trial run for those first two games of the World Cup. So I think he will go with his strongest possible team um, against England and then rotate two or three, or maybe a little bit more into that Wales game. He's already, sorry, Warren Gatland has said that he's discussed selection with Joe Schmidt for those two games. So good luck if you bought a ticket. You're, you know what you're watching is not necessarily the, the purest form of sport. Yeah. They have discussed what they're going to do in terms of their strategy. Um, I think Wales went quite strong at the weekend and obviously lost Garth Anscombe, which is a warning to everyone about what the damage these war- warm-up games can do. But I think Sexton does need to have two, at least one or two games under his belt. So, come yeah. what may, and I'd say you'll see Carty and Byrne in the, in, the, in the last in the kind of farewell game at the Aviva, which gives Johnny a kind of two two to three week build up. You know, lead in and any niggles or anything can be worked out. You know, with the flight and everything uh, in between. So I think that's the way he's looking at it, um, and that kind of makes sense if you think about it. I mean, the warm weather thing is to set them up for the conditions in Japan, um, and he does need to know how he's going to go about those two games. So he'll obviously be trialing a few people. He's naming a squad in between the two Wales games, mm. but at the same time, he's trying to get that t- that squad ready to hit the ground running. Because in reality, the f- the third choice. Uh, lose head or tight head prop and stuff is really not going to be what wins and loses well it might be but it, it, unlikely to win or lose the World Cup whereas yeah. having the lads ready to go on September 22nd is way more important Ireland 29 Italy 10 yeah already feels like quite a distant memory it will it not does. be for much longer in the memory yeah anything of no to take you mentioned Carby played very well I saw one or two people make the point that Ireland did not box kick at all from scrum half from nine which was an interesting observation mm. So maybe they're trying to mix things up in that regard. Anybody catch the eye for good or bad reasons? I thought Chris Farrell, uh, Joey Carberry, Andrew Conway, Jean Klein and Ty Byrne off the bench will all be very happy with their day's work. And Klein and, Bur- uh, Klein and Byrne are probably in a uh, straight shootout for the one spot. Just did the, did the match again. A lot of people are saying they might be able to bring both of them. I think the only way you do that is by bringing an extra forward, an 18th forward and, and, and a reduced number of backs, which seems like too big a risk. Um, I think Farrell played his way onto the onto the plane. Um, any doubt that was there about whether he would get the nod ahead of say a Conway who might go as well. This yeah. this this conundrum with the five halfbacks probably opens up one extra slot. And Conway was really good in the air, mm. linked really well with Carberry. Um, there's nothing to say that Conor Murray won't be box kicking in, in two weeks' time as they pivot. They might yes. even be trialing game plans for you know what suits Scotland, what suits Japan. Um, but Carberry was very much running the show. It wasn't a Kind of a French style nine run in the show. It was Car- it was Carberry's um, show to run. Luke McGrath was there to give him the ball. Um, and McGrath's a good box kicker. He's a stronger box kicker than Kieran Marmion. Mm. But they did kick. They varied their game very well. I thought for the first fifty minutes they did a lot right. And then after Carberry went off and a number of substitutions, I'm sure it spooked the players to see a player, you know, an important player stretch it off as well. Absolutely. Um, it was hard to do any proper kind of analysis of anyone. But Byrne came on one two very good turnovers. 
but then the Italians were quite poor. So those players can all be happy with the work. I don't think anyone necessarily played themselves out of things. Um, there was no one who really had a real stinker. Um, Jack McGrath, I say, was disappointed. I know he was pre-planned. You probably knew it ahead of time, but to get only get forty minutes, forty decent minutes. But I think he'd want he'd like to have more time mm. um, to get back on the to get on the plane. And other than that, it was you know there was lads who did okay without really putting the case forward that they should go ahead of someone else. Okay. England on the 24th of August, next up for yeah. Ireland at Twickenham. Eddie Jones has named his 31 very early. The yeah. deadline, I think, is September 9th. And Jones said, we've taken the decision to go early because of what we learned from previous campaigns. We want the squad to know from early and now we can just get on with being the best prepared team England have ever sent to the World Cup. And we want to be ready to win the World Cup. He's back talking about winning the World Cup again, I notice. Mm. I do see a good logic in that. I, yeah. mean, I, I think this X-Factor-esque thing is quite stressful for the players, I would imagine. I know you can argue, oh, it keeps everyone on their toes. I think the World Cup will keep you on your toes. Yeah. But anyway. Um, and he was interesting as well. He was saying when he picks his World Cup squad, and I want to get your thoughts on it because it's interesting, but he was saying when he picks a World Cup squad, he picks 1 to 15 first, and then he goes right the other way, and he picks numbers 28 to 31. His logic being... These are absolutely key, 28 to 31. They're possibly not going to have much game time, so the character and behaviour of those guys is super important. And then he picks a blend from 16 to 27. This is the Getty Jones process. It was mm. a nice insight. Now, you're going to have to make sense of some of the inclusions here because there's a whole host of very familiar names left out and then some eye-catching and unexpected inclusions are uh, Rory McConaughey, uncapped, came over from Sevens last year, been playing for Bath. We have Willie Hines at scrum half at 32, made his debut on Sunday. Their only scrum half cover for Ben Young's, Willie Hines. Yeah. They have uh, Lewis Ludlum, a uh, flanker. His first training camp was in June, just gone, made his debut on Sunday. Brad Shields didn't go. Um, Piers Francis as well, pipped Ben Teo. Is Ben Teo not going because he got in a scrap? I think Ben Teo's primarily not going because Manny Tulagi is so good and has come from... You know, I think a lot of people thought he might be on the cusp of retirement and kind of out, on his way out of the game after an injury he had a couple of years and was the dominant figure certainly against Ireland in that Six Nations game and and and, and in a couple of others as well. So I would imagine that if Tuilagi goes down, they'll be picking up the phone to Ben Teo again. But you could understand having moved to uh, Worcester, a club he didn't really ever want to go to, although on very good money. But at the behest of Eddie Jones, why Ben Teo is is a bit miffed. But maybe yeah, the, there's certainly um, the fight. Wouldn't have done him any favours, and if if what if you take it, what Eddie Jones says there, good value about good characters and stuff like that, yeah, then that's where that plays into it. I mean, who I think the, who are the big omissions that people are talking about? Mike Brown's not going. I don't. I didn't expect Brown uh, to go. Bob I I, not I just thought Ben's, Hartley, all these guys aren't. Going. Yeah, I, they're not that much much of a. I think yeah. Jamie George has kind of come to forward. Yeah, you know, the Saracens' core of that pack is just so good, and their first team is so good, and we kind of saw the way he was moving, but I. Ben Spencer is one for me. I thought uh, he was a scrum half for Saracens in the in the their run to the European Cup, and I thought he played his way in. He was the one whose box kicks caused so much damage against uh, against uh, Munster in that uh, semi final. He was really excellent. He's been in and around their squad, mm. and to pick a guy from Gloucester, a, a Kiwi, um, who apparently is there because of his, his smarts, because he's played for Canterbury and in that kind of this is Willie Hines. Willie Hines, yeah. uh, just very very strange. I mean, he's had Danny Carr there, who's obviously a very very good player over the years. He's had Richard Wigglesworth, who's probably on the way out, but still could have brought a lot of experience. To go with a, a player like that is a real surprise to me. And I think Spencer was the coming man and could have actually pushed um, Youngs a bit closer. Their court, their team is still going to be very very good, but they've a lot of inexperience in that kind of that that five players that you mentioned. Um, Ludlam seems to be very highly rated, but yeah. I mean he has had opportunities to spread the net. He he went to Argentina a couple of years ago and gave the the Currys their debut. He, you know it was a completely different team, a lot of young players. Mm -hmm. Those players seem to have disappeared, mm -hmm. and he just somehow on the eve of the World Cup has found a whole new. I, mean, I suppose England rugby has such depth, yes. but it's very confusing. And like you can see with Joe Schmidt over the four years what he's been doing, and even what I said about the scrum halves. There's a hierarchy there that's yeah. clearly established, yeah. and the All Blacks I don't think would ever bring in four or five players like this on the eve of a World Cup. It doesn't speak of good practice, but Dan Eddie Jones has, has been part of a World Cup winning setup. He's been to a final. 
he was part of a Japan uh, piece of history last time. It's not his first rodeo, so no. you know he's obviously they're not doing it for the crack. Their yeah. first twenty is still fairly frightening, though. Yeah, they? their match day squad will be excellent. No, they're going to be fine, um, and they probably have a navigable pool. They, they'll fancy themselves to beat Argentina and France. A couple of those guys might give them a bit of energy around the place. They might be good characters that we, you know, we just don't know. About. I mean, yeah. I just don't see enough Premiership rugby to know a whole lot about these guys. And it's not like they were all. It wasn't like we were coming away from European games raving about these players. You know, they. And Jones has said he doesn't really rate the Premiership many times. Yeah. And also, he's been building up their fitness. Sorry, he's been building up their fitness for three or four. You know, all, we, all we've heard is that their his England training camps have been remarkably brilliant in terms of building up their fitness. Well, well why weren't it, these guys in there? So you can swan in last minute. Yeah, and exactly. Just fine. It's yeah. very, very unusual. But uh, Eddie's unorthodoxness has got him far before. Yeah, I guess maybe a bit of freshness is what he's looking for. So. Mm. Um, that's the England squad. So August 24th, Ireland play England in Twickenham. Our, our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. We're talking with Rory O'Connor from the Irish Independent. Now, I, now you may not have heard this, uh, Rory, mm-hmm. but New Zealand, New Zealand are not um, in the brilliant shape we might expect. This has been the most um, talked about New Zealand wobble in, in quite some time. You were watching the Australia game in Perth. They're going to play at Eden Park this coming weekend. Yes, I which is not what you want when you're Australian. It's yeah. a bit like Ireland beating them in Chicago and then bringing them back to Dublin yeah. uh, two weeks later, although Eden Park is, is Eden Park. Um, you watched this Perth game, did you? Yeah, I watched it. I didn't watch it live, so I, I knew the results, so, right. and right. I knew there was a red card coming. So Scott Barrett was sent off, or, um, I think it was early in the second half, uh, or late in the first half. He, he was sent off for a, a dangerous charge um, that which, connected with a head. Which Eddie Jones said was... Not a red card, that was, I, that that was I thought it was a very timely intervention by Eddie Jones when he didn't want to talk about his own squad and Ben Teo getting in fights and things like that. Right, okay. I mean, the, the, the Rug- World Rugby directive is clear. Like, Scott Barrett went charged shoulder first into um, Michael Hooper's head, didn't wrap his arms. Yeah. It looked like a red. It was very like the Sonny Bill Williams one on uh, Anthony Watson and the Lions tour two years ago. Yeah. Maybe not quite not as bad, and he's got three games. He'd be, he'd be available for the first World Cup game. But it was a red card in the current interpretations, and I think this is going to be a talking point during the World Cup because mm. coaches are not on board with it, it seems. But, and it, look, the 14, like rugby is probably, hurling is probably the only sport where it's harder to play with 14 men, um, although Tip has proved that recently, but it's, it's once you're down to 14, oh, like yeah. we see during 10 minute periods, it's not a, a great um, situation to be in, and they, they kind of hung on against the Lions in 17 and, and just about lost, but Australia made them pay, and Australia looked really, really good in doing so and, and kind of seem to be doing that old Australian trick of, of timing the run really well. But the All Blacks, the same vulnerabilities that we've been talking about since Ireland beat them in 16, the Lions went and beat them in 2017, that Ireland exposed again in, in, towards the end of 2018, England almost did it as well. South Africa drew with them last week, they weren't great in, in Argentina. They've kind of pivoted towards having Mwanga at 10 and Bowden Barrett at 15 just on the eve of the tournament, which, yeah. again, a bit like Eddie Jones, it, it just seems like a strange time to do it. And they've done it off the bench a few times. I think they did it in Dublin in the defeat. They're just, they're still the best team in the world, mm. but they're not as good as they were. And it does make for uh, cliche alert the most open World Cup we've had in years. I mean, it, it does look that way on paper. And the box have just hit their shops. They've lost their attack coach today for personal reasons. He's pulled out of the squad. He's not going to be involved anymore, yeah, uh, which is a bit of a blow, blow for Razi yeah. Rasmus. But they have welcomed back Sia Khaleesi, their captain, who's missed all of this recent upsurge and is just this really widely respected figure of the new South Africa and Erasmus has kind of built the whole thing around them and he's coming back on Saturday in their yeah, game against he's an inspiration yeah, fella, yeah. yeah so he's, he's back this weekend for their kind of last home warm up game they're, they're playing an out of competition game against Argentina and um, before they take on Japan so um, yeah New Zealand they're definitely looking like they're on the downslide and, and South Africa are, are looking up but there's still a couple of weeks to go mm. and the All Blacks have the talent to pull it around and the coaching now and all that sort of stuff so you wouldn't be going writing them off but they are definitely gettable and Australia proved that in a number of ways they really physically went at them and beat up their breakdown and they're just not the players that they lost to retirement after the last tournament they've, they've just never really been able to replace them with players of great talented players but not mm. of the same calibre in the kind of even the leadership stakes and all that sort of stuff yeah I mean, it will be very interesting to see this weekend. I think, you know, we well, could have a, a very different conversation. Absolutely, and uh, that's why you, you know, I mean, Stuart Barnes, I mean, we talked about it on Sunday, Stuart yeah. Barnes effectively wrote them off on Saturday. Yeah, it's true, but we were, like, sorry to repeat, I know, because you were in the Sunday paper review, mm. but Barnes, and I mentioned this to Liam Toland, if you're listening to the podcast and you've heard this already, so I won't <laughs> repeat myself uh, for a third time, but Barnes listed off five or six very uh, difficult to argue with kind of reasons as to why New Zealand will not win the World Cup and then when you add them all together things are compounded and it was a very convincing argument I must say but if he turned his focus on 
all six contenders, I think he'd come up with five or six point. reasons why. And that's why I think it is actually going to be that, that open and, and that exciting. Because even from the first weekend, you know, um, if South Africa take down New Zealand, or even if that's a classic game, it just sets everything off. Scotland, Ireland is, you know, 60 40 in Ireland's favour, certainly in the bookies. But, you know, the Scotlanders have named a good team for their first warm up game in Nice on Saturday yeah. against uh, France. Yeah. Like, that's not, not going to be easy. Like, it is, there is a sense that more than really in any tournament, that I can remember that a lot of teams can take each other down and like when you get the top eight teams in that quarterfinals they're going to be wide open they're, they'll be very uh, even the fact is I think four teams can go number one in the world this weekend that just shows how right. open it is yeah Wales missed their chance last week when they lost England but it's yeah, yeah it's it's just closer than it has been like New Zealand are still the, the market leaders they've got the best players they play the best game but um they can be gotten at more, way more than they could have, could have in 2015 and 2011. And even then, you know, South Africa went close in 15 and France should have beaten them in 11. So they've never been utterly unbeatable. Yeah. The Scots have Duncan Taylor back after two years out injured. And John Barkley's back as well yeah. against all the Six Nations. So they're timely returns for the Scots. Yeah, and they have four games to get through. So, you know, they should get those guys up to speed even though they haven't played much rugby. And they'll be dangerous. They'll be, you know, I think Ireland will always back themselves to beat Scotland. But, it, you know, it's a very difficult fixture to start off on. And that's why... These three warm-up games in the next three weeks will be, even though the warm-up games are quite important about getting, like they can't have another couple of scratchy performances like that Italy one, because really there's no time to find cohesion in the way that you know 2007 was such a disaster because they never found cohesion in the warm-ups. Yeah. So remind us again, they're off to Portugal today. They're gone. They're gone. They're there till Thursday. They fly directly to London, playing England, picking them, then Wales back to back, and in between that they name the squad. Okay. They're pretty much then away from the glare of. Us types then, aren't they? Yeah, I, they are doing media in Portugal next week, so uh, a couple over. of us are going over, yeah. Okay. Um, and that'll be, well, it'll be nice for us. Uh, and it'll be, it, I think it will be good for them. And it'll, they, they'll be living in each other's pockets a bit, a bit of bonding, even just a dry run for the World Cup, you know, in terms of that, that sort of thing. Um, and apparently conditions are going to be quite difficult and it's going to be very much a top of the ground World Cup, um, which I think will challenge them. And I think having that training over there, it seemed to work for them. They seem to like it. It didn't work for them in the Six Nations. They have great results, but... They seem to like yeah. that, that camp in, in, in Portugal before the Six Nations, so um, I think moving them around is probably good because they are together quite a long time. Yeah, change of scenery. Mm. Rory, thanks, Emil. No worries, cheers up. Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Down to business. This week, Down to Business is coming to you live from the Republic of Work in Cork to celebrate Food Fest 2019. We'll be looking at the business of food in Cork and we'll be asking if Leesiders need more buses. We'll be hearing 101 reasons why Cork is actually better than Dublin. Plus, after the show, the audience will get to enjoy some fantastic Deliveroo food samples from the best local producers. It's all thanks to Deliveroo delivering food freedom. The event is free, but you do need a ticket, so simply go to newstalk.com forward slash events to secure your place. Down to business. Brought to you by Bank of Ireland. 